Good afternoon, and welcome to the Northern District Historical Society's program about a case that um, was heard a number of years ago in this district. And you are going to be fortunate enough, as we tell the story of this case, to hear from some of the key players who were in that case. And they're all surrounded me up here, and uh, we're delighted to have each one of them. Each one of them deserves a, um, a lengthy introduction, but I don't want to take the time to talk about them, because I think you would rather hear from them. And so we're going to turn immediately to, uh, to hearing from them. But uh, just, by, uh, just by way of um, your information, what we're going to do is do it chronologically. Because we're telling a story. We're telling a story about how this case got started, uh, how it continued through the court, and how it uh, ultimately got resolved. And so we're going to take our speakers in accordance with that chronology, with one exception. Uh, and that is one of the prize winners of that case, uh, Chief uh, Joanne Hayes White, Joanne Hayes White, excuse me, um, who is with us, but she also has another obligation, which um, I hope she does better than the team itself does, because she's going to go out there tonight and throw out the first ball of the Giants game. So we have to let her leave early. So we're going to actually start with her. <laughs> And um, you have in your materials biographies of all the panelists. So if you want to know more about them, you can find out. Uh, all I have to say about Chief Joseph, uh, Hayes White, because she's such an incredible person and she's about to retire, is that she was among the first uh, of the women who joined the San Francisco Fire Department after the consent decree. She joined the San Francisco Fire Department in 1990 and she became chief in uh, 2004 and is still the chief, but shortly to retire. And uh, you can find out a lot more about her and also about uh, one of our other speakers, uh, Chief Robert Demons. I found out that there is a website, and if you want to know more about them, there's a website called, that I'd never heard of before, um, called the guardiansofthecity.org. <laughs> Guardians of the City, and you can pull up wonderful information about the fire department, about other departments of the government, and also a lot of information about these individuals in particular. So I welcome, uh, first of all, Chief Hayes White. Let's hear from you and your experiences and tell us about the department and a little bit about the beginning and a little bit about where we are now. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge Patel, uh, it is a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Neha Gupta with the City Attorney's Office. She also happens to, uh, one of her roles is advising the fire department. So uh, thank you for including me in this. Uh, it is a very esteemed group of people. Um, I'm honored to be here sitting with each and every one of you. And all of you play an integral role in me sitting here today as Chief of Department. So um, that that has to go First and foremost, my gratitude and my appreciation to all of your hard work. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge Mayor Edwin Lee, who was also very much a part of this case as he was working for the Asian Law Caucus at the time of uh, the consent decree and advocating for a more, more diverse workforce. Um, I am a product of the consent decree. I was within about the first 20 women hired. The consent decree began in 1987 after lots of hard work. The first women entered the department in August of 1987, I believe. And uh, we still have one currently still on the job um, and the others have retired, but they were the true trailblazers at the time. And um, I entered in 1990 and as Judge Patel said, I currently have served as, uh, so currently serving as chief for four more days. <laughs> I retire on May 5th. And um, I think I started something because my successor, I'm very proud of her. I think she was going to try and come by. I don't see her in the chambers currently, but that is Janine Nicholson, who I promoted to deputy chief last year and Mayor Breed selected as my successor. She'll be sworn in Monday morning, May 6th at 11 a.m. Very, very proud of her and um, all that she'll do to continue to, to lead the department. Just a little bit uh, that I wanted to note, a little history. And then I'll talk to you about, I'll fast forward into to where we're at now, but um, the man next to me also uh, deserves 
major credit for, again, for me being in this position in that midway, early on in my career really, um, we got to know one another and he gave me a huge opportunity. Um, and as I just talked about her, she's entering, it's perfect. So let's give a round of applause to my successor, Janine Nicholson. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Chief. Uh, and so Chief Demons, promoted me uh, early on in, in my career, and um, that was an opportunity that, again, I think put me into a place where then in 2004, another visionary leader, then Mayor Newsom, who's now our governor, selected me as chief of department. But so just to give you some statistics, uh, on May 1st of 1988, the department was 83% white male, and that's when the first seven women came in. There were six that graduated in that class. So definitely less than 1%. And then in June of 89, another class was hired, 13 women, just about the 1% mark. Um, and there was about, uh, there were 80% white male at that time. So you can see over a little bit of time now in 93, 70% white male, 52 women, about 3.5% women. And throughout the country today, that's about the average in the big cities. So Boston and New York have less than 1%. LA County and I believe LA City have about 3%. And so um, we were there in 93 uh, because of the consent decree for sure. Um, in July of 98, um, and that was midway through Chief Demon's career, we, he made great strides. There was 148 women representing about 9.7% of our workforce. Um, so in a relatively short period of time, two years as chief, you really turned things around and made opportunities for women and minorities. Um, and then um, there was 56% white males at that time. Um, at this time, currently, I'm really proud to report, as I fast forward to this year, we have 15% women in uniform. We lead the, the country, and really, if we're leading the country, we're leading the world with women in uniform. 261 women uh, with 49% white male. So more than 50% of our department members uh, are minorities, which I think in this city, really in any city, the workforce should mirror what the community is. And you know, less so in a fire emergency where there's sort of this universal language of we're rushing in where people are rushing out, but 75, 80% of the time what we're doing is responding to medical calls. And to have someone that can convey or obtain critical medical information, we have many bilingual speakers. Um, and you know, growing up, I played a lot of team sports. And I think you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful, sort of segue into the fire service being a blended team of people. Maybe back in the day, someone thought that you know, a crew of four men that were large in stature, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, they were the best to have. And I've seen time after time, whether it be fire or medical, the fact that you have a blended team of people is much better. Uh, sometimes we go over a cliff and we're gonna send the more agile person into a confined space, we're gonna send the smaller statured person. So it really makes good sense, not only from a justice point of view, but from, a, from an operational strategy and tactics point of view, to have a blended group of people. And that's exactly what, as I leave this department, uh, after nearly 30 years, I'm very proud of, my number one proudest achievement is the continuation in it now almost 21 plus years post consent decree. Uh, there was concern that there may be some backsliding and if anything, uh, we, we've, we've broken the records of the goals that were presented at the time. So again, I think, and I'm not gonna put words in Chief Demon's mouth, what Chief Demon saw and then what Mayor Newsom saw in me was someone that would greatly respect our rich history and tradition, which we do have. We became a paid professional department in 1866. But they also wanted someone, and they saw in me, someone that would respect that piece, but really bring the department into a more modern, progressive, inclusive environment. And that's exactly what we've done, and that's exactly what I know Chief Nicholson, my successor, will do. And having worked here and been chief for 15 years, I've been privileged to hire 1,200 of our 1,800 members. And all shapes, all sizes, all ethnicities, genders, I'm really, really proud of that. And um, with that, I know I want to be sensitive to the time. I'm happy to answer anything else you might have, Judge, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot. And, and again, to say really, truly, it's an honor and a privilege to have served in the San Francisco Fire Department and as chief for 15 years. And um, thank all of you for me being in this seat, in particular to you, Chief Demons.
Thank you very, very much, Chief. Um, we're going to miss you, um, but we also welcome Chief Nicholson. Congratulations, and um, I wish you a very, very happy retirement. Um, but we're very proud of what you have done, and you've carried on the spirit uh, that um, um, Bob Demons and all the people who brought that lawsuit uh, were imbued with when uh, they brought that lawsuit. And it's good to see such happy results. Thank you, and we wish you well. Thank you. Um, now, you've heard uh, the chief talk about Chief Demons. There was a time when Chief Demons was not chief. <laughs> <laughs> he, joined, he joined the department in, in, 1990, in 1974, is that correct? And wasn't that as a result of one of those earlier lawsuits? Yeah, wait. You may hear from some of the attorneys when they talk about this case, or if you read the decision itself, we went through a history of prior cases that were brought, both in this court and in the state court. And uh, some of those, they all had to do with various minorities and promotional issues and, and hiring issues and so forth. Um, the, the suit that we're talking about here included it's about all minorities, uh, the MALDEF, the Mexican-American Legal Defense Fund, the Asian Law Caucus uh, participated, Legal Aid Society or, or Employment Law Center, um, the, um, the group that you were involved with. Lawyers Committee. Lawyers Committee. The Lawyers Committee, of course. I, forgive me. And, um, and then, of course, a number of, of women's groups were involved, uh, and equal rights advocates uh, represented many of them. Um, so this was really a consolidated action, uh, and you'll hear about some of that later, I, I assume. But this was a consolidated action dealing not only with hiring, and, and um, in that case, there had been no women before that time, and uh, hiring of more minorities, and, and also the treatment of minorities. And um, a man by the name of Bob Demons was a plaintiff in that lawsuit. Um, <laughs> And that is called the Davis case, uh, but uh, he was one of the plaintiffs in the, in the lawsuit. And that was, the case was filed in 1984. Um, and lo and behold, he became chief in 1996. Uh, and from 1996 to 2000, he served. And I will just make a, a very quickly a note that, um, and I'm sure Tammy would agree with me, who was the monitor of the consent decree, that he took over a department that did not treat him or minorities very well at all. In fact, some of, you would be shocked to hear some of the things that went on that they had to put up with in the city and county of San Francisco. You would think this would have happened somewhere else in this country maybe, but not here. Um, so I was shocked when I heard some of that testimony. When he became chief, you know, you'd think sometimes well, I'll get mine now. It's my turn. <laughs> the only thing, the best way to describe his conduct during that whole period of time, from my observation, was he was what I would call Nelson Mandela-ish. He was a gentleman who respected even those who had not respected him and who was even-handed with everyone that he dealt with. And that is, you know, I was just so impressed with how he handled that position when he became chief. Uh, the only other thing I will note about that is right after it was announced that he was by Mayor Brown, right, at his, actually his inaugural ceremony, that uh, he was going to be the new chief, about a day or two later I get a phone call from Bob and he wanted to talk to me. I said, you can't talk to me. You're a party to this lawsuit. He says, no, 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 you're not chief. I said, no, you're just on the other side of the V now because now you're a defendant in that lawsuit <laughs> as a chief of the department. And, uh, but he showed that whether he was a plaintiff or a defendant, he could be fair and even-handed. And so, Bob, take it away, <laughs> chief. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief. <laughs> For more, more than just introducing me. <laughs> <laughs> The um, diversity and inclusion to the San Francisco Fire Department actually started in 1955 when Earl Gage, the first African American, was hired. <clears throat> there were 1,800 firefighters at the time, and he was the first African American. I, I recall as a 
young teenager hearing a lot of the things that he had to deal with. The second one wasn't hired until 12 years later. And that was in um, the, the second and third. And then a year after that was the year fourth. In 1970, Western Edition Community Organization, Waco, filed a suit because they were concerned that the department was absent of any African Americans other than the four I mentioned. <laughs> that suit was uh, handled by uh, NAACP and a lot of other attorneys. And that was the case that went on. It was in uh, Superior Court. And that went on for a couple of years. <clears throat> I took the exam myself, and I really didn't plan on coming in the fire department for any long period of time, only a couple of years, till I finished my uh, engineering degree. But I got in and found out a little bit more about the department a few years later. So as you know, I stayed. <clears throat> the next real move was when they entered that consent decree which ended in 1977. In 1974, as uh, I believe Chief Hayes White said, I was uh, hired. In 1978, I took the uh, examination for lieutenant. At that time, the consent decree stated that you got 1% per year up to 12 years of, of service. I only had four years in at the time, so I knew I had to study extra hard in order to uh, compete, which I did. Uh, I, uh, after taking the exam, I found out that a lot of the questions out of uh, 144 multiple choice questions, 122 were repeat from prior exam that individuals that had been in the department for a while knew about and had. The next thing I knew, after filing a protest with the city, um, it was ignored, and Bob Ganesda, who was with the uh, public advocates at the time <laughs> and was part of the Waco suit. So myself and the person I had studied with, uh, Jim Braden, we contacted Bob Ganesda and, and uh, asked him to do something about the city ignoring my protest. And Jimmy Braden also filed a protest <laughs> a couple of days after I did. That we went, they ignored it and didn't hear it. So Bob Ganesa arranged a meeting with Mayor Feinstein at the time. And we, they, she ordered the Civil Service Commission to uh, hear a protest. The Civil Service Commission scheduled the, pro, uh, the hearing at 5 p.m. at night. At the time, I didn't think much about it. And it was interesting, one of the black firefighters' wife overheard one of the commissioners saying that he had received a call and he had to come there to take care, take care of the guys. That night, the chief of the department called all the individuals that were on the list that could be, be reached to the division of training at 9 o'clock that night and swore, swore them in. And the reason for that was he wanted to prevent us from being able to file an injunction the next morning. And the reason they held a hearing that night was because that same reason. Uh, obviously, it was really painful to me knowing that something was wrong and the people responsible didn't care about. Um, unfortunately, the, the leadership of the black firefighters at the time, which was a social organization, they didn't uh, want to challenge the test and they sided with the city and the firefighters union. After a few months, the uh, president re resigned. And in fact, he brought his resignation to my house. I didn't even know he knew where I lived. And I asked the guys, I said, okay, now we need to let's run somebody for president. And they were all looking at me like you looking at me. And I said, no, not, not me. <laughs> and they said, well, why, why, Bob? I said, well, one of the reasons is that I don't like to talk in front of people. 
And one guy said, well, what the hell do you think you've been doing for the last few, <laughs> several weeks? <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> so after becoming uh, president, uh, I took on, obviously, the responsibility of representing the members. And that's when I started uh, speaking out for them on behalf of the harassment that was going on with the, with the mem black firefighters. And I got as many books as I could on how to file complaints, EEO complaints. And I found out about the Office of Revenue Sharing at the time. So uh, I filed a complaint with them. We also filed a complaint with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. And those didn't move too fast. And one day I told a couple of guys, I said, well, let's go to the director's office and find out what's going on. Because the, Jimmy Braden, they had found him in the middle of the street. He had felt, fell off the uh, fire truck at that time. On, only the officer and the driver rode in the cab. The rest of the firefighters rode either in the tiller or on the turntable. So you were outside and you strapped in. And he fell off the uh, rig. We found out later that someone had tampered with his belt. But he had received a lot of ha harassment prior to that. So I talked two of the um, black firefighters to go to the director's office with me when she was in the state building at the time. I didn't know who she was. And we got there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I said, well, we're going to stay until she meets with us. We didn't realize the state police could have come and put us in jail. But I guess we didn't care. And we had put together a short uh, summary of some of the complaints and some of the things that were going on. We didn't get to see her until 3 o'clock. She was upset. And, uh, her receptionist was just upset because we were sitting across from there all day long. And one of the guys went and got some candy bars so we can have lunch. Mm -hmm. Finally, after 3 o'clock, she called us in. And I handed her the uh, information. She then said that she was aware, and I, I, like I said, that was the first time I met her, but she was African-American also. And she said she had heard about a lot of the things that Earl Gage had gone through in that department. And she called in her attorney, uh, Beverly Tucker, and we didn't have an attorney. Uh, Jimmy Braden and I had been all over the uh, Bay Area, all over the Bay Area, trying to get legal representation. Um, so we didn't have, and so she said we need to get an attorney. And because we didn't, she eventually filed a director's, and I understand it was the first director's lawsuit against the fire department. And she received a lot of pressure to back off, but she, she stayed with us. <laughs> We couldn't get any coverage on the things that were going on in the media at the time, so we created our own media where we, we would print up flyers. We had a place over in Berkeley that gave us a good rate, and we'd go over there and put up, print up flyers. We had an extensive mailing list of all the politicians or organizations and radio and TV stations, and, and we would mail stuff out to them, and plus we would be demonstrating and passing up information, things going on. This went on for quite a while. And um, found out that the, excuse me, the Office of Revenue Sharing, I went back there and met with the uh, uh, representative. And he knew me by that time by just my voice. And so he, he told, you know, told me that uh, they were dragging their feet. And I think it was on Ed Meese. Yeah. So he told me that there was an attorney that was filing a, a, a thing about filing a suit against them to try to get them to um, speed up and deal with the cases. Uh, her name was Rosalind Gray. So I met with her, hmm. and she was with the lawyers' committee back there. And she said, "Well, you know, there's a uh, we have a after I gave them a lot of information." Or, several weeks I'd mail her stuff and she says you know we have an, an office lawyers committee office back in San Francisco and uh, there's a uh, woman back there that's really great and she can really get things moving for you guys and uh, her name is Eva Patterson I said okay I got back and I called Eva 
And uh, when I called her, Eva took off, she said. Oh, thank you for calling, returning my call. She had called me the day before, which I didn't, wasn't aware of. Yeah, I went, went to know if the black firefighters would be a part of the Amigas brief, and she went on and I, what is, what's the Amigas brief? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and so she explained it to me. I said, of course, uh, Cleveland Vanguard case was there. So after she uh, gave me a chance to talk, I said, I really was calling you for some help. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of how the story went went on for quite a while and uh, eight, almost a year. So we were bombarding her with information, documentation of things that were going on in the department. And she called me one day and she said that she was in a bark tunnel somewhere and she said the last batch of information we gave her broke, broke her down in tears and she says, I'm gonna do everything I can, can, can help in that point. She introduced us to William C. McNeil the third. Is that right? <laughs> third? Yeah. <laughs> Mess kidding with him. But um, and he was that at that time in private practice. And like I said, we were trying desperately to find any kind of legal representation. Uh, and he came aboard. And I just have to say that over the years I found that. I've only known, personally, two African-American men that have been involved in a public interest law firm. And I see the other one, Michael <laughs> Harrison, sitting in the audience there, and Bill. And that really, that really um, had a lot of questions as, as to why. But I can understand in this society, it's not easy for people to exist in private practices. Period, and you know, some people, but and Steve, so would, this be a good, would this be a good time to turn to the lawyers now to have them? I'm over five minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least, <laughs> you're going to get a reprise too. So, <laughs> so I think it, it, the, the three lawyers that uh, <laughs> that we have over here are among the battery of lawyers, but these are three of the key lawyers who handle the case. And you hear how we, he got to Eva. And um, you can take it from here, please. I'd like to acknowledge Michael Harris, who's part of the team, as well as our comrades who aren't here, Russell Galloway, Ed Lee, Mary Dunlap, Maria Blanco, and Denise Hewitt. And it was really a team effort. Um, I'm a big talker, like Bob. But I want to say before that it's interesting being in the federal courthouse, because this was all about challenging white supremacy in the San Francisco Fire Department back then. Clearly, it's not happening now. But that's what was going on then. And we had the federal government trying to stop black firefighters, Latinos, women, and Asian Americans from progressing. The reason I called Bob was because the Justice Department under William Bradford Reynolds and the Reagan administration um, said that the only people who could be the beneficiaries of of the outcome of federal litigation were the specific victims. And so we were looking for black firefighters to file an amicus brief. So it was this perfect kind of um, coming together, which is kind of a lot of the thing, a lot of things happen in the case like that. Bill and Sean are gonna talk. I'm just gonna talk about a few things. A lot went on. It's really wild being here with on the same level with you, because we're used to having the tables turned that way <laughs> and you up there. So this is kind of nice. Um, um, but I'll just, just touch on a few things. Um, and Shauna will talk about the Justice Department too. We found out that the Justice Department was gonna file a lawsuit and they do these things, they go, they file the lawsuit and settle it on the same day. And the basic MO is, we didn't do anything wrong and we won't do it again. And we heard about this from Reverend Gloyd, who was on the Civil Service Commission, who had gotten wind of this, and he, he gave us a copy of the consent decree and we went, mm -mm, this is not gonna go. When Bob first came to me, I, I didn't want to get involved in the case, so Bill took the case. And then as I had my road to Damascus uh, experience and decided I had to, to work on the case. I'll just share a few things with you. Bob talks about Earl Gage. He was the first black firefighter in San Francisco, 1955. When you're a, a beginning firefighter, you go into the firehouse replacing people who are on break or vacation or whatever. Earl Gage is laying down. All of a sudden, he finds himself flipped onto the floor. The white firefighters, and this isn't against 
all white people, but these white people were messed up. They told their colleagues that a black man was sleeping on their blanket and their mattress and they flipped him off. So from that day on, he had to take a cab to each house he went to with his own mattress. This is what went on in, in fabulous San Francisco. Bill got involved in the case. He's going to talk more about that. Uh, we're going to have more of a conversation than, than a presentation. Um, I was on the board of Equal Rights Advocates, the women's law firm. At the time, the case was only involved in African American <laughs> firefighters. I remember our colleague Donna Hitchens, who was a, uh, who was a judge now, I guess a retired judge, she had heard that the when women were going to come into the fire department, that the black men were going to file a TRO or an injunction to stop women from coming into the department. I said, that's absurd. I know those brothers. They would never do that. And so we had a meeting. I remember Shauna's daughter, who's now 30, was crawling. And I feel old. Now no, she was, she's 35. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to feel younger than you are. That makes you what? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. We're part of the historical society today. Mm -hmm. But she was crawling around on the floor, and the black firefighters and the women who were going to come into the department Department met and decided we would join forces. And I think that's one of the reasons the case was so strong. At various parts <coughs> of the case, the women's part of the case was stronger. At other parts, the black part of the case was stronger. But coming together, we were very powerful. And I think that's one reason that, that we prevailed. We ultimately brought in MALDEF and the Asian Law Caucus. But I'll stop talking now and turn it over to Bill, who actually got the case started. Well, I'm not quite sure that that's true, but thank you. Um, I was supposed to talk about something that I'm not going to talk about initially. Uh, we, we sort of talked about how the case should look, and we had some theories, and I don't know if any of you will remember from law school, those of you that went to law school, Stotts had just recently been decided. And we were trying to figure out, because Bob had come with black firefighters and talked about the impact of the various examinations that had just been given. And we were very concerned about certain things. So the first thing we thought we had to do was to stop those examinations and having people promoted or hired. Because once you read both Baki and Stotts, they talked about the impact of so-called trammeling innocent white employees. So we wanted to make sure that we were not going to be put in a position that ultimately would result in essentially a Pyrrhic victory. We wanted to stop those examinations or any hiring or promotions from them, and uh, we are trying to figure out the best way possible. Uh, my wife had um, a friend of hers in law school who said you, you, you would bring every course down to at least two words. And in looking at our case, we, we, we saw more than two words. Uh, the first thing was an old pattern of discrimination, which we thought we had. Judge Patel already and Bob mentioned the Waco cases. The other word that we liked was the inexorable zero, which represented how many women were in the department at that particular point in time. <laughs> and we decided that it really behooved both elements to work together. And we were going to do this with regard to a class action. And I was Mr. Grouch about that, saying, oh my god, we got these divergent people. We're going to run into problems with r remedies, because the interests of women were different from the interests of the men. Uh, the interest of black women might be different from those of white women, but Eva and Shauna prevailed and, and we went forward. And I think the, the case, uh, by working together, we did very well. Unfortunately, trying to prepare for this, I started looking at a lot of stuff. And I mentioned to Judge Patel uh, saying, you know, you dismissed the case. <laughs> very early on, and she said she doesn't remember that. I don't know whether we should believe her or not, but 
I mean, those were the types of problems we had. And I'll add one other thing. We were fighting three people, three different defendants, although only two were defendants at that particular point in time. City and County of San Francisco, Local 798, which was the union, and the Justice Department. And it, was, it became very difficult because it was, you were trying to negotiate and navigate with regard to all three of those entities. And I'll talk, turn it over to Shauna with regard to the women's stuff. Thank you. So um, um, I left practice to become a law professor. And the firefighter case would be a great exam for civil procedure because it was so complicated given the many parties and the different roles they played. One of um, our concerns bringing the case on behalf of the women was a change of the physical agility entrance test. That clearly was not the same barrier for the men of color. So that was the kinds of issues that we were um, trying to think through as we litigated this case. But I want to talk a little bit um, about some of the procedural uh, gnarly parts. We filed this case, Davis case, and it was a race discrimination case and a gender <laughs> discrimination case. The race discrimination case was only against, at that time, on behalf of, excuse me, black men. The Justice Department, allegedly other plaintiffs, comes in, this is under the Reagan administration, doesn't believe women should be firefighters at all, Fire, files a case um, saying you need to do better in hiring all men of color with a consent decree. So what do we do? We intervene in that action. But by, and by intervening in that action and representing at least some of the real parties and in interests, the black men, we were able to stop them from entering into a quick consent decree on behalf of black men. But then they wanted to move on Latino men and Asian men. So within, and the wonderful thing about the public interest community in San Francisco was that we have all worked together. So very quickly we were able to get MALDEF and the Asian Law Caucus to also intervene and stop the consent decree that they were trying to put in place on behalf of Latino men and Asian men. And now we have this huge group of Asian men, Latino men, African American men, and women generally. And we ended up then realizing that we should break up the women in terms of women of color and white women. So we are moving forward now with five subclasses in this class action case. And I often think that the women of color, in terms of the entry level issues, were really pivotal. Because unless you really fixed both the physical agility test and the written test, they would not be benefited. And having them as part of the plaintiff's class I think allowed us to keep our eyes on the prize for the um, bigger picture. One of the facts that really helped in our discrimination case um, for the women was that women weren't even allowed to apply until 1976. And when they applied in 1976, they took a physical agility test. The next, none of them reached a high enough number to be hired. The next time they gave the physical agility test, they removed the two portions of that test on which women had done best. <laughs> and I mean, if you're talking about intention, their actions really helped um, us be able to tell the intentional story. And I also <laughs> want to give a shout out to the black firefighters because not only was Donna Hitchens' info incorrect about the black firefighters enjoining um, women coming into the department, the black firefighters helped train the initial 
group of women who took the physical agility test. They had a training program for applicants. It was geared for black men applicants, but they also brought in the women and helped them train um, for the physical agility test. Um, and then, of course, we had Local 798, which was a true defendant. And then another group formed <laughs> called San Franciscans for the Merit System. And they were essentially white men who had applied, who wanted to stop us from bringing our lawsuit. And I think I'll end it there. Mm -hmm. Do we still have a couple minutes? A couple okay. minutes, and then I'm going to turn to... Okay, I'll talk real fast. A couple points. We were racing to the courthouse to beat the Justice Department. Uh, second, your point about physical agility is really important because we learned there were things that women could do with our lower body strength that was just as effective as what men could do with upper body strength. Earl Gage, first black firefighter, took us to his house for brunch, told us all the dirty secrets about the department <laughs> and how the... Firefighters knew all the exam questions before they went in, and we t it was fun taking depositions and kind of letting them know we knew that. The harassment was terrible. They would make gorilla sounds when black men would walk into the stations. They would put eggs in the boots of the firefighters, so you're coming down the, the <coughs> and, and jumping into your boots, and there's eggs in it. Um, the, um, let's see. The clients, it was real interesting, because sometimes we would fuss. <laughs> and we'd have uh, and we'd have real different points of views, but things ultimately worked out. The council all got along, and that was really a way to harmonize our interests. And then I think this is the, these are the days when um, newspapers were big uh, because we were in the newspapers all the time with just the crazy stuff that would go on. For example, one of the chiefs retired, and chief, we hope you don't do this for for either of you, but at the going away ceremony, he was given a swastika as a going away present, and it was um, a, a symbol of his proud German heritage. And I'm not making this up. That swastika <laughs> was stored here in the federal courthouse, it somehow disappeared. I don't know what uh, to make of that. Um, there was also a situation where one of the um, black firefighters actually helped somebody in an explosion, and Local 798, which was much more of our enemy than the city, just to be honest, um, they had a picture, and Bob found this, and they had all the firefighters, and you see all the firefighters, and then you go down, and there's somebody's legs. And what they had done is they had literally whited out the torso of the black firefighter who had been the hero and thought no one would notice. That got on the cover, I think, of Life magazine. So there was a lot of crazy stuff going Going on. And Chief, I'm so glad to see you here because you're going to have black men coming to you complaining about stuff. Please listen. This stuff is real. It's 2019, but racism is alive and well. So please, please listen. The other thing I want to say is when one way we were kept on our toes was our daily 6.30 a.m. phone calls from Chief Demons telling us what we needed to do each day. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm going to turn to our former uh, city attorney uh, and the estimable attorney, Louise Rennie, who has her own practice now doing good work. Uh, on behalf of the public, and Louise came into as was appointed as uh, the city attorney after the case had begun, but I think you were there for most of it. You yes. were certainly there when it wound down to the consent decree and participated very vigorously in that effort. So let's hear what it was like to when you first encountered the case. Well, first of all, I I really cannot tell the whole story without mentioning George Riley, yeah. because George Riley was the one who really handled the case for the city. George died way too young, and I think that at his memorial service, Chief Demons was there, Judge Patel was there, Tamar Yee were there, Eva Patterson, gives you some idea of the respect and the good work that George did. Uh, just a quick little background about George, seeing Judge Alsup here, some of you may have been here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, two weeks ago when Judge Alsop spoke about growing up in Mississippi and how during his high school years he saw that the Mississippi way of life was not the way to go. Well, George grew up in Memphis 
and even as a youngster was involved in civil rights, and all his life, even when he was in a very lucrative private practice, he dedicated a lot of effort towards civil rights work in Mississippi and throughout the South, and, and his projects have continued on. Uh, in my own case, I'll only say that my husband and I had been involved in civil rights work during the Kennedy administration. I was the first woman city attorney appointed by the first woman mayor. So I think George and I had a pretty good idea of where history could and should go. But we also had our hats representing the city. Uh, when I first became city attorney, what I found was that there was one attorney literally handling all of the fire department cases. The, oh, and did I mention we had the police department cases going on. Jail overcrowding was perking its little head up. And so they say, may you live in interesting times. We did. <laughs> and, but basically, all these public protection cases were being handled by one lawyer. Well, that wasn't going to work. So I completely reorganized the office, was lucky enough to get George into the office office, appointed him as a special assistant in charge of this case. And as I say, the, the rest is some, somewhat history. Um, when George walked into the courtroom, I know Judge Patel, you once told me you thought, who is this kid? <laughs> but George really had, I think, not only the legal skills, but we quickly realized that this case to really be resolved in a good way was not only going to take legal skills but some real diplomacy because there were strongly held views within the city. A uh, reference was made to Local 798, some of these other groups that were out there. And I will say George worked very hard to try to push down the, the sentiment and we recognize that change is hard for many people, but it has to come. And so we approached it from the standpoint of, of what needed to be done, what had to be done, and as they say, the rest is history. Well, you worked very, very hard at uh, accomplishing something, which we're now going to get to, uh, which was the the um, the resolution of the case and the consent decree and you if it had not I think been for you and your motivations and your uh, efforts that probably the city would not have come to the table uh, as a matter of fact there were some attempts to keep the city from coming to the table and you prevailed through it all and we're going to hear about what happened? Because we, we went through some trials. We actually had some, a lot of it was done by motion. But we did have some trials that involved some testimony. That was really with respect to uh, the treatment of African American men, uh, officers in, in the, uh, in my, correct? Because I remember some of the testimony we took. We took testimony that related to how African American officers were treated in the department. Remember that? Because I remember, we're going to get to that because you, I remember some testimony that you gave. But let's talk about how this case ended up being resolved because a lot of time was spent carving, you know, creating the consent decree and hammering it out and the details of it and then um, the monitoring of it. So who's, who's, well, who's, who's going to talk about that? Well, the, the first interesting thing was uh, Judge Patel sent us out for a settlement conference with a guy who had been, I believe, general counsel for EEOC. And we ran into a, a little problem initially uh, because he said, well, we're going to start at 8, we're going to start at 7 a.m. <laughs> and we had children. <laughs> and we said, no, we'll be there at 9. Uh, and it, it, it it was really quite interesting. Uh, before Louise Rennie came in, I thought the city's position was over our dead bodies Here, because the exchanges were, were not particularly productive. Uh, I don't even remember Local 798 being there. Uh, they just refused to deal with any of the issues. So we, we spent a great deal of time doing things. And as Judge Patel said, we had a number of hearings. And I just remember her saying to me one time, she says, Mr. McNeil, 
do you think there's any possibility of this case settling? And I said, uh, Your Honor, there's probably some possibility, but it doesn't look very good. And then, uh, unfortunately, that city attorney passed away. And the, the attorney that had been on that case, a guy named Mike Killalay, we were in DC doing depositions of expert witnesses. And there was a break. Mike came back in and he said, the depositions are over, I'm leaving. And you know, everybody's sort of like, what? He said, a very good friend of mine, uh, the city attorney, just passed away, and I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going back to San Francisco. And with Louise Rennie being appointed, the atmosphere, I would say, changed. And we had a number of opportunities. Judge Patel forced us to engage with the city. We had probably three or four conferences where the, the mayor, then now Senator Feinstein, said she didn't want to deal with me. She preferred to deal with Eva. I can't imagine why. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it came down to uh, there had been a consent decree drafted. And I think Local 798 had gotten to someone in her office. And we were at one of her one of these meetings in her office and she said, I've read the decree and it's just full of preferences. <laughs> and we said, you clearly didn't read the same decree that we read because the word preference isn't in there anywhere. So what are you talking about? And it, then it, it sort devolved. of yeah, devolved into you don't know what I'm talking about, nor do you care, and those kinds of things. And then she said, well, we have to leave in any case because the 49ers were playing a playoff game. So we, we sort of knew what, what the city's interest really was. But after a certain amount of time, and I think it was Judge Patel asked us if we would agree to have her be the settlement judge as well. And she asked us to brief the issue that seemed to be holding everything up, and that was the issue of whether there could be gender and race conscious relief. Again, we, I mentioned Stotts earlier, Local 93 had come down, uh, but the Justice Department had been filing amicus briefs, and there were three cases that were up in front of the Supreme Court at that particular point in time. And we ultimately got Judge Patel as our tentative settlement judge. The United States Supreme Court decided two very good affirmative, essentially affirmative action cases where it determined that race conscious and gender conscious relief was available, both in terms of after trial and with regard to settlements. And I think that moved things along at that particular point in time. And it, then it, it became an issue of what would be acceptable to all of the people. And, and we, we got around and, and we came. The Justice Department didn't involve itself in any of those settlement discussions at all. Local 798 didn't, and, at, and I, before we came out, I was talking to Judge Patel. We were the first people here. Uh, we had a hearing about whether the consent decree would be accepted or not, and I don't even think the Department of Justice showed up for that settlement no. hearing. Uh, local, 79, local 798 did. It opposed the decree. And I believe stated in open court, if you approve this, Your Honor, we're going to appeal. Which, which they is, did. Which, which exactly, they, they did, exactly. And I did, they did, we did, they, <laughs> they did, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So, so uh, that, that was sort of the settlement discussions, and a large number of people were involved with that, and all parties except the Department of Justice and arguably Local 798 engaged in it in good faith, and we came up with something. And then it was challenged. I just want to jump in here. I was surprised pleasantly that um, the city also agreed, and I give this 
credit to Louise on this, to allow Judge Patel to also serve as the settlement judge with the understanding if we didn't settle, she could still hear the case in trial. Uh, we did have a couple of sessions in your chambers, I remember, because I was representing the plaintiffs. And one of the other great things that I think Judge Patel did when we met in chambers is she had Bob Demons there. She had one of the plaintiffs there. And the reason I think that was so helpful to all of us is because as we got into the nitty gritty, having an insider who was in the department to tell us the kind of detailed remedial structures we needed based on his experience of what was going badly within the department, but also what had not been covered effectively under the first consent decree, the Waco case of the 70s, was really helpful. And there were little things in the decree that I think really helped us have the diverse department that Chief Hayes White described today. For example, before promotional tests could be given, you had to have a certain percentage, or we said goals, of women and people of color in the rank below so that they could have the opportunity to take that test. And what that did is it motivated the unions to keep, and the department to keep, hiring and promoting and meeting those numbers because otherwise you couldn't have the next lieutenant's exam and you couldn't have the next captain's exam. And that was Bob Demons' idea. And I think he knew what would motivate uh, the, de the city, the fire department, to keep the consent decree going. The other things that we did that were really important for women were we put in the decree things like uniforms that fit, attire that you sleep in, the kinds of little details that we hoped would keep the women from being harassed once they were hired. So I think having Bob in there um, was really important as we were negotiating. Of course, as we really got into the nitty gritty, the union disappeared and the justice department disappeared, and it was really just the city and the plaintiffs ironing out all these details. I think that a great deal of credit also goes to you, Louise. You want to say a few words about what that process was like? Because things really, once you became the city attorney, things moved along. Well, thank you. As I say, Judge Patel, I think with George and my background, it was clear that what had gone on in the past just simply wasn't right. And we had gone through the, I think my first vote on the Board of Supervisors was on the Police Department Consent Decree and uh, to, to agree to that. But I'll just tell you sort of two humorous stories about, you know, obviously a city attorney, you not only work directly with the departments and the Board of Supervisors, but mayors. So two stories about mayors uh, following uh, Mayor Feinstein was Mayor Agnos, and he often tells the story that his first day in office, uh, I, I come in and I say, Mayor Agnos, uh, Federal District Court Judge Marilyn Patel would really like to see you in your chambers this <laughs> afternoon, if at all possible. <laughs> And then I, I don't want to just jump ahead, but I will say forever in my memory will be the day when Willie Brown at his uh, swearing in down at Yerba Buena Gardens and announced that Bob Devins was going to be Chief Robert Devins. And that was, that was truly remarkable. Yeah, truly remarkable. Well, once you have the consent decree, of course, then things follow, right? There's a period of time that's in, that it's extant, and you've got certain requirements you have to meet and follow up on and so on and so forth, and that required monitoring. So um, I invited uh, Tamar Pachter, who is seated to my left, who was at one time my law clerk, and a very fine one, 
And then she had gone out into private practice, I think, at that point. And um, we had a we had appointed a woman who did a Barbara Phillips, who did a fabulous job as a, as our first monitor. But she uh, she left the area, and so. Uh, an African-American member of the Fire Commission by the name of James Jefferson um, agreed to serve as sort of the monitor and supervise the consent decree. But he was not a lawyer, he, and he sort of was uncomfortable doing that. So everybody agreed, all the parties agreed that Tamar could come in, that she was familiar with the case, was there when the consent decree had been entered into, to, part, to be the lawyer. Uh, assisting uh, and being a co-monitor with him. And so she uh, observed some of the things that went on during the monitoring because the fun didn't just stop there. And the fun didn't stop when uh, <laughs> Bob Demons became Chief Demons um, because um, this really tested his mettle and he proved himself um, up to the job and then some. But uh, we had a number of complaints that were filed by white firefighters, in fact, a lot of them. And um, uh, Tamar can tell you about some of the experiences she had in monitoring the case and making sure that everything went as it was supposed to. So um, you can see I was very lucky to be Judge Patel's clerk <laughs> because then I got to meet all of these fine people and be involved in the execution of the, of the consent decree. Um, the consent decree uh, addressed two separate things. It addressed the development of the promotional exams and the physical agility test to eliminate the adverse impact that they had had on women and minorities who were trying to apply to the department. And it also addressed the claims of individual discrimination. And under the consent decree, one of the things um, that the monitor was to decide was to help resolve these individual claims of discrimination, subject, of course, to review by Judge Patel. So um, Barbara Phillips, who actually was appointed monitor before the consent decree as part of one of the injunctions that you issued against the, uh, the examinations, was mm -hmm. that if the department had to hire in order to fill positions, because after all, it's public safety, there had to be the appointment of a monitor um, in order to review that hiring. And Barbara was appointed, I think, at that point before the consent decree was entered into. Mm -hmm. um, and she did most of the work resolving the individual claims of discrimination. Um, so mostly when uh, James Jefferson, who had not only uh, served a long time uh, on the fire commission before he was appointed, but also was a real community leader in the city of San Francisco. Um, his role was very important because he could talk to the members of the fire commission, he could talk to the politicians. I remember meeting with Mayor Brown uh, before his inauguration with Jim Jefferson. I think they had a little talk about what was actually <laughs> going to happen. Um, it was very exciting for me. I was a very young lawyer, and my job was primarily to make sure that progress was being made on the long-term hiring goals, progress was being made on validating the exams. And I have to tell you, that was incredibly difficult for the city to do. It had been. They had been working on it since the 70s and hadn't been able to come up with an exam that they could validate, which meant that they could show that the requirements of the exam were actually related <laughs> to the jobs that they were hiring for. Um, and just prior to entry of the consent decree, I don't know if you remember this, Judge Patel, but there was an incident at one of the firehouses, again involving a swastika, in which two minority firefighters oh, right. returned to the firehouse and found swastikas ha hanging above their space. And uh, the court held a hearing. I think that's probably where most of the testimony was given. And at the end of that hearing, the judge entered an injunction holding responsible by name each of the battalion chiefs and captains who were responsible for running the firehouses. And I think that had a lot to do with why the city came to the table on the consent decree. 
because the testimony that was given during that hearing, uh, I think, really shocked the conscience. Um, during uh, the time that Jim Jefferson and I were supervising the consent decree, uh, Louise, you were still city attorney, and I can I can remember uh, finally in the 90s having a conversation with you, and you were saying, I will never sign another consent decree. <laughs> <laughs> because the work of actually getting it done was incredibly difficult. And not a lot of it was about the legal issues. Oh. <laughs> Most of it was about transforming a department uh, that had become a professional department in 1866 that was built on tradition, where family members succeeded one another in the department. I think that's still true today. And turning that department into a professional fire department. I think the same was true in the in the police department. Police and jails, and jails. all at the same time. <laughs> and the, the, I don't mean to interrupt, but just implementing a consent decree is hard work. You want to make sure you don't have to have one. But we used to have at least once a week weekly meetings where there, there had been goals for week to week what had to be done. And we there was a, an expert from Berkeley whose name escapes me right now, but it was Jelly Jelly Jelly. Jelly. that's it, on some of the tests. And uh, but we had weekly meetings to make sure that you know we were trying to get toward those goals. It was a lot of work. <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> It was a lot of work, and, and despite the effort of experts, uh, you know, it was early days, right? And not everybody knew exactly what they were doing, <laughs> and nobody could guarantee the outcome. And um, there aren't very many consent decrees out there anymore. Hardly anybody enters into them. And I think... Uh, I'm not going to tell you where there maybe should be. <laughs> um, I think part of the reason is that um, lawyers are uh, in many ways ill-equipped to get this job done. It's a job of uh, changing culture, changing professional standards, um, and uh, convincing the city, the government, that this is something that they need to do and that they will have to do. Um, and the role of the judge was mainly to keep reminding them that they had to do it. And um, for many years, the city had been trying to write exams and hadn't been able to write an exam that could be validated. <laughs> and they tried and tried. And I don't think a lieutenant's exam was given until when? It, it took a while. When was that? In in the 90s. Yeah. The first one. First one. The, in 76. No, but after the no, decree. No, 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 no. After the consent decree. I after don't think a lieutenant's decree. exam was given until the 90s. I don't remember, but it did take a while. It took a long time. Yeah. Well, one of the things that also happened was the, the union was really the you know, <laughs> the, the troublemaker in all of this. I'm trying to, they, fi they filed an appeal. Ultimately, the decision was affirmed, but they filed an appeal. And um, while the consent decree was pending, um, a number of them, I know they gave Chief Demons when he was chief grief, you know, and, and, and but also they filed, they started filing complaints. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. They started filing complaints. They, they didn't realize they were going to be related to you. Yes, well, well, so I remember one day looking out and we had like 30 of these white firefighters who had filed complaints. You've never seen such ridiculous complaints in your life. I think the only one you suggested maybe, maybe had some merit was some guy who complained because somebody had called him Freckles. Um, and it was a little hard to even take that one seriously, but they were just troublemaker kind of, of um, 
uh, of uh, complaints that they were making, but they were making them to the monitor because you would have to go through all of those complaints and sort them out. And it was just, it was just, um, it tried to keep a straight face about some of them, but uh, I do remember, you know, at one time they had 30 of them in the courtroom and I gave them a little bit of a lecture uh, but, um, about it and uh, told them to grow up. But, uh, <laughs> but I think you also had a fair amount of attrition also amongst some of them who didn't want to play ball. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think you can tell us, you know, in, uh, what it was like to try to then come in as the chief, having, having been the plaintiff in this lawsuit and the troublemaker. Now you were going to have to uh, take over this department. And what was the so we're going to finish with this. You tell us what that was like. Well, stressful. But <laughs> what, what happened, the um, several months, in fact, less than a year before I was appointed, I stopped and thought about it. And I said, you know, as president of black firefighters and so forth, we were fighting all these, a lot of years to trying to get the chiefs to do the things that needed to be done. And I said, I'm going to do whatever I can to become chief. And it was interesting at that point, I didn't know who the mayor was going to be. I think uh, Mayor Brown hadn't even announced, but I was just so determined, and I started working to that end. And one of the things that was real interesting was that, as you recall, you uh, called the department out of control and ordered the department to hire a management consultant. And when I, the way I looked, that management consultant that was hired after taking away almost $500,000 of taxpayer money had, was fired. But not only that, I knew the history of a lot of consultants coming to the fire department to solve the problem. So I was determined once I became chief that I was going to be the management consultant. <clears throat> and Tammy was on me every day saying, <laughs> chief, you ought to, <laughs> you're in contempt. And I didn't say this, but I was thinking, well, no, I'm just going to be in contempt. But I didn't. I didn't. She, she was on me every day because she was doing her duty to, to follow the judge's order. And fortunately, Judge Patel didn't lock me up or hold me in contempt and allowed me to, to move forward. Because I knew that in the San Francisco Fire Department, you have a wealth of talent. Almost anything that you want done there's someone in there that can do it. And I believe that things are supposed to happen by the person responsible for making them happen. And the rest of the members of the fire department, I felt, was my management team. <laughs> and I was a consultant. Uh, I held, held a retreat, assigned them all, all the leaders specific duties and timelines to to accomplish based on our mission statement and our value statement. Hired a uh, mediator, come, not a mediator, but hired a uh, facilitator to come in from UC Davis. And uh, I tried to get some, someone that I knew that some of the macho guys would look up to and listen to. So I found this guy that could have been John Wayne's twin brother. <laughs> and he came in and did an excellent job. And I was really impressed. We had a three-day uh, retreat. And prior to that, I sent out a general order asking every member, every member of the fire department to come up with challenges they faced in doing their job and challenges they saw the department had department-wide. I got a tremendous amount of response from the members. Again, my view was that every member of that department had a brain, and, there, and I didn't want to not use those brains. And you heard Chief Hayes White say something. Well, wh what I was looking for was, we, Judge Patel had said we had to, didn't have the ability to manage ourselves. So what I was looking for was individuals that could manage things, and uh, Chief Hayes White proved that. That's why I moved her to different things. And one interesting thing that, was, that happened, too, was that when uh, I recall years before, I looked up the definition of affirmative action and said any action uh, it, with the exception of immediately 
correcting the past discrimination thing. So I'm very impatient. So what I did was I would, had the opportunity to assign Chief Hayes White as the uh, chief of training, woman over the training. Hmm. And I hired, well, we hired in groups of 30, and I hired 15 women at one time in one class, and that worked so well. I hired 16 the next time, <laughs> and that worked real well, and I hired 17 the third time. <laughs> and so I think it was really important not only for, for the women that were coming in, but it was important for the men also to see that uh, women can do, do the job. And, and Chief Hayes White did the job in training what he wanted to do. And in fact, the, the years that I was chief, we only lost one person in that division of training, right. one person. And I have really had to question the training officers and everyone there that I had faith in. And, and they told me that, no, this, they couldn't cut it. But I, I was really proud of the job that was done at training. And um, the, the other, thing, <clears throat> other thing that I was trying to do, looking at the testing. And what you find is, and I, this is a problem not only with the fire department, but with the police department. The consult, test consultants say they have to use fire department personnel and constructing the, as job knowledge experts in constructing exams. I think that's one of the biggest problems where you see a lot of adverse impact because I had one consultant and you know, when we were all putting pressure on him, he wanted to try to save his job. This was before the consent decree, right after. And he wanted to meet with me. And so I arranged that we, we meet at the, uh, in Earl Gage's old office. And the reason I wanted to do that, do that rather than a coffee shop, Earl Gage in his office, they had a, a glass instead of a wall. And the reason they had that glass was they wanted everybody to see that they had one. <laughs> okay. And so I felt that was a good place for me and the consultant to sit down and talk about the exam. And what he did was he offered to hire, um, use a captain that I rec would recommend. And he said, but of course, you have to swear that he's not going to tell anybody what's going to be on the exam. And obviously, I didn't go along with that. Uh, but it was um, real interesting, again, and I want to talk about this. One of the reasons that I, uh, I looked at, I hired a, a tremendous large number of uh, Asian Americans and women because they were the most underrepresented group in the department based on their population in the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. I look what's going on now and I think this is real critical and I don't know who, who can handle it, handle it, but the firefighters here, but fire departments turn over every 20 years or so because people are hired in large groups. And one of the things that I wanted to, to, to do was, I know that a large, not a lot, a number of the people, women and uh, minority men, got in as a result of the courts, not only in San Francisco, but I saw, saw that around the country. So one of the things I wanted to do was try to create a, a, a system where they wouldn't have to rely on the courts to make those decisions. The, and in fact, I went to the um, Harvard leadership uh, course they had back in, uh, at Harvard. And one of the things that we were required to do was to say one of the, identify one thing that we were ch uh, challenged with. And that's what I put down as what I was, we were challenged with. And that was to create a selection process that could continue to bring diversity and inclusion into the fire department without the courts. Mm. And uh, it's something I put together, but there's still a lot of resistance to doing that. I still have things that I try to do, like an officer's candidate program, a cadet program, things like that. But you know, the politics get hot and heavy when you're talking about uh, things, and I understand that. And, and it's even more important now because the uh, IFF 
have millions of dollars that they're earning on the CPAC. And it's real interesting that they're, they're now the ones that control the physical agility. Okay, not only for San Francisco, but for the other departments around the, the country. Hmm. You know, that's that's really something. You know. Any comments from any of the rest of you uh, about uh, the follow-up? And um... I have two quick things to say. Um, often, opponent, opponents of race-conscious relief think that unqualified people will get into positions. And I remember in one of the classes, there was not a qualified woman of color to enter. And we said, if there's not anybody qualified, then we don't want to just put anybody in. So you need to understand that's how affirmative action really works. It's not this bugaboo that people think, oh, just rotten people are getting in. The second thing is part of the consent decree was to adjudicate racial harassment claims because the black firefighters had been treated so abysmally. And the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights um, recruited, I think, about 38 attorneys from downtown law firms to represent the African-American men. And the men ended up getting almost a million dollars in damages, which won't make up for what happened, um, but it certainly was, was good. And George Riley was a big part of that as well. So I just wanted to add those two points. And that was very important, because I still remember your testifying in one of those trials or hearings. And um, that's where the shock of what was going on in, in the department really set in. When you told about, you were serving as a driver for the deputy chief or someone, and you sort of casually commented to him how, you know, you you'd enjoyed hearing that he had been a walk-on in a movie or something or whatever, and um, you said, you know, just casual conversation, I assume, and you're saying, well, you know, that sounds like fun, you know, I'd like to do that sometime. To which he responds, this white deputy, to Bob Demons, well, the next time they need a nigger pimp, I'll let you know. Oh. Am I right? Yeah. Um, I, I sat there, my jaw dropped, and I mean, and that was, uh, there were other incidents as well as to how uh, minorities were treated in the firehouses, like your food, tray of food dropped in front of you while everybody else had to watch you pick it up or whatever your response was to that. And, uh, and just things that just did not happen. Uh, and when somebody said something about preferences earlier, well, before that time, before the consent decree, there were preferences. Yeah. <laughs> you know who had the preferences, right? Thank you. <laughs> so it's just uh, equalizing preferences is, is, what, you know, is what the consent decree did. But I, I want to thank all of you for participating in this this evening and, um, and also for what you did to make, in your own ways, uh, every one of you, to make the department um, a much better department, and um, there's always room for improvement, but it sounds like at least this is one consent decree that had a fairly positive results overall. I think so. If, if, if I could, I'd like to <laughs> mention something that really struck me, and that was the first time any firefighters marched in the Pride Parade in uniform, period was myself and two other black firefighters, and we just had our banner and just, uh, but I noticed in years now that there's so many uh, firefighters participating in uniform that they have several apparatus and then a lot of them walking and stuff, so that, that really meant a, meant a lot to me. And what, the reason we did it was because we noticed that, first of all, there was people like Mary, Dunlap, who uh, we call one another brothers and sisters, and and a lot of people like that. That I n noticed that in the uh, St. Patrick's Day parade, everybody that's mar marching is not Irish. <laughs> I noticed the Chinese New Year's parade, everybody marching there is not uh, Chinese Americans, and uh, Juneteenth, everybody's not African American. So, and I say the people from that community are taxpayers too. And they deserve to have their firefighters participate in their event. <laughs> so that was something that, I, in fact, uh, Eva had 
I don't know if she still had it. She had a picture of me and the, it was James Outley and uh, Jimmy Dunson. And we, when we were in Washington, I was, I don't know, she just had a picture. I was pointing my fingers and I don't know what I was saying to him, but, <laughs> <laughs> but she had that in the office. But I will say this, that the energy that came from the people when they saw us was just something that I can't ever get over in my life. I, I've never seen it. It was like they were going to break down the barriers. And obviously, all individuals weren't from that community, but they were supportive of the community, and they saw what we were supporting them. So that, that one of the things that I cherish um, a lot. In fact, a lot of the guys in the firehouse were saying, uh, were mad because we were doing it. They were out there in uniform and so forth. And one of the black firefighters said, that um, one of the guys asked him, say, uh, is Bob gay? And when the black firefighter uh, told me that, I said, well, uh, why don't you tell him to ask me? He said, nah, Bob, you know you're not going to ask you. you know? <laughs> but, but I just wanted to say that because that, well, to me, that just shows a, how broad the diversity has gone in, in, in this department. <laughs> well, we want to thank all of you for your participation in the case and all that you did and your monitoring afterwards to make sure that that things happen and um, and for your participation in this program as well. Thank you very, very much. Oh yes, I, yeah, oh my most, most important duty, um, your evaluation sheets you need to fill out if you have them, if you don't have one, make sure you get one and uh, fill it out. And uh, Judy is standing. Judy Stoiko is standing back there. She'll make sure to get uh, get your forms. And also, thank you very, very much, Judy, for your work and helping to put this together. I appreciate it. And Nia, would you stand, please? Nia Gupta, <laughs> putting the program together. Thank you, and thank you, everyone.